on, baby girl. How are you, beautiful? Ava. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Um, you. I'm so happy to be joining you. I'm so happy to hear. Well, this is like the second go because we had kind of rough start to a a podcast whenever that was last year. Um, But I'm so happy that we're doing it now because if you think about everything that has transpired um, in life, but specifically in your life from back then to now, I mean, I feel that there's just been so much more expansion for you. So there's a lot more to unpack and, mm-hmm. and talk about in this conversation right now. So much. It's, it's, it feels like a different, like different chapter, but almost like a different life. You know, it's like, right. okay, like different, like total, I just like night and day, but I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful. It's just amazing how much can change so quickly. You know, what would you say is, or are some of the biggest or biggest change, like just off the top of your head set from back then? Um, last year, I mean, due to COVID, but also not due to COVID, I, um, have shifted most of my business online. It was mm-hmm. jump started by COVID, but it was in the works before that. Um, and of course, a little bit of me was like slightly beating myself up when <clears throat> everything shut down in March. I was like, I should have gotten this out sooner, but I was like, that's okay. Like I didn't have quote unquote time, right? Yeah. Like before I wasn't yeah. making time for it. And it was a gift from the universe, the universe to create. And to it was like, I kept saying, I was like, my partner, I was like, I feel like I just need like two weeks just like off from work to like get my house together and get everything together. And then Mm. I need like another week to like just kind of get all this going off the ground. And I was given that time to do. And so I was not complaining when everything shut down. I was like, this was my answer from the universe. (laughs) I was like, I need a break. I need a moment to like catch up, you know, and to get some things going. And I was given that. So I just really took that as an opportunity. Um, and I'm so grateful that I have been able to pivot, you know, what seems like pretty seamlessly thanks to some, some people, you know, and, and to the time, the gift of time that I've been given. <clears throat> yeah, no, it's incredible. I mean, your website is gorgeous and, Thank you. you know, I know firsthand because you have been one of my favorite movement instructors, right? So you're a yoga instructor. I, I you're like a movement artist, a movement coach. I mean, you have a dance background and I'm picky. I'm not really a group training kind of girl, Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I got down, I love hot yoga classes and I love like the hot hit classes and sculpt. And and one thing that I, I mean, you just, I love your style. It's so, you're just, you know, you have the perfect amount of intensity and yet you have the perfect amount of flow and this kind of you know, or just everything just feels harmonized. It's not like, I don't need, I don't like like somebody like, ah, go, you know, but I also, right. I like a level of seriousness in, in, in the movement program, you know, and, and you all, I mean, that was one of the reasons why I just resonated with you and I loved you. And where I was really going to go with that is that I know, cause we've been friends for a minute now and to witness you and your schedule and how it has been, it's just like you were so stacked on stacked on stacked, you know? And so, yeah, it makes perfect sense that, you know, you would really need this break to be able to just take a moment to, you know, kind of reset. And it's funny, you say two weeks to get that off the ground, girl, that's, that's a hustle Mm -hmm. because, Mm -hmm. you know, what you've created with your incredible website, um, you know, you have your virtual classes, you have journal. Pro- I mean, you, there's so many awesome components to it. I know firsthand as a, a brand builder, it's not easy to, to do all these things. And it's, it, you know, you still picked it back up with work. It was like, there was a, right. There was a moment maybe yes. where there was like a, a pause, but then you, you got right back into it Yes. in addition to what you built. And so you know, it's, you said it was a pivot, but I want to invite this idea that to me, it feels more like an expansion, you know, because pivot is almost like you turned really quick and you went in another direction. But to me, when I look at your website, when I, you know, and then knowing you and knowing where you, where you are now having a podcast or, you know, co-host to an amazing new podcast, it's like all of this stuff was they're waiting for you to just tap into it to like water it you know it's like the Mm -hmm. seeds were there and now you're just blooming but it's all been 
it feels like it's just so been a part of, of your program. Totally. And that's like, so thank you. First of all, it's super sweet. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that because that is how I wanted it to be. I had a lot of a, an aversion to teaching online a lot before I've been teaching privates online for almost five years. So that was something that was already, I was already doing. So I know how to coach bodies through movement online, but I had some hesit. I was a little bit hesitant to provide on demand content for a couple of reasons, but I had a, I have a friend who's my web designer and who's much more than that. She's like a business partner um, who had been kind of pushing me to go in that direction in January. We had a meeting and she was like, I really feel like, you know, it's be smart to have some type of online presence where there's some type of, it's a little bit just like steady and it's there for you, right? So that you don't have all these fluctuations. Like you can take a little bit more time off from work. You can travel, you can do mm-hmm. these other things and have the flexibility of having something steady there in the meantime. Mm-hmm. And so for me, it was super important when we did, because then in March, I like, I was like, how quickly can you generate an email list? How quickly can we, you know what I mean? Get this going. And she was yeah. so helpful. I wanted it to feel authentic to me, mm-hmm. which is part of branding. Right. But I also mm-hmm. wanted it. I hadn't had a website before that because I hate websites that don't look good. Mm-hmm. And you know, that, that yeah. are half ass. like you've, we've talked about this. I yeah. don't do anything half ass. And so if it's just like kind of there, I don't want it to be anything less than a full representation of me. Mm-hmm. And so I had a lot of hesitation with creating something because I didn't want it to not fully represent me. And so now that I have something that I feel like does represent it, I feel so grounded in it and so good about it, even though it's virtual and that's so different from like the yoga practice that a lot of us are used to um, because it feels like it's still authentically me. And I think people can feel that and people are connected. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. So good. It really, it really, really does. Um, it makes me very proud because I, all the pieces, everything just, it really tells, it says the story of, of, of Ava and that you, you know, it is, it's not like, Oh, I just threw this up and this is what I do. And I'm inviting you in. It's like, there is an experience there that you yeah. offer, you know, the people who come onto your site. And it's funny. I want to actually ask you about this. Um, from what you were just saying, how you didn't want it to not, not represent you. You were very clear on, you know, I want it to really tell the story of even like, how, you know, be branded well. Do you feel, cause we, we hear a lot of talks around perfectionism and then mm-hmm. how that can create a hesitation. Was there any of that in the mix for you? Or was it that you were just very clear on what you wanted it to be and what you didn't want it to be? And it was a matter of, really creating the time and the energy really to be able to invest in building that? I think it was more of the second. I think it was more, I knew it was going to be a big project and I wanted to give it the time and space it deserves Mm -hmm. instead of like, just, you know, being like, yeah, whatever. And so for me, it was like, it felt like it was able to wait until it wasn't right. It was like, it can wait because everything else right now feels more important. It's right on the forefront. And I Mm -hmm. was like, all over the place doing all these things. And I was like, I'll do it when I have a moment, but I didn't have a moment. And so when I was gifted it, I was like full force ahead and ready. And even with the final product, it's like, we're still continuing to add to the site. So that was, I was cool with that with Bernice. I was like, I want to get it up there and I want it to look great, but we don't need to add too many different things. Cause I'm also like multifaceted with dance and with yoga and movement. And like, there's all these different pieces that I didn't want to like overwhelm people. I was like, let's just start with like the basic, right. And just mm-hmm. get it out there so that their attention isn't like all over the place. And then we'll continue to add. And that's what we've been doing. We've been adding not only different services, but also like components to the site and components to the platform, mm-hmm. which feels nice. Cause then it's also like shows people that I'm doing, developing it as we go, then I'm continuing to add and build it yeah. with them. It's like, this is not the finished product. This is the beginning. This is the starting, you know, and mm-hmm. to have people along the ride with me for that process is cool. That it's not just like, here it is, it's done. There you go. But it's a constant work in progress, which I think is very different from how I would have been when I was younger. Cause there was a lot of perfectionism in my dance years. Um, that would have been a major detriment. But I think I was able to trust my, my girl, Brittany, enough to like put the design in her hands and be like, what can you create knowing me and knowing kind of my values and like the work that I do. Um, and I just couldn't have been happier that I let, that I gave her that creative freedom, right? That I wasn't micromanaging 
the process that I kind of like let it unfold and it was something greater than I could have ever dreamt up in my own mind. I love that. Yeah. It's such an important, cause you know, you are a very, um, you're a, you're a get shit done woman, you know, and mm-hmm. I'm a get shit done woman. And yes. we hear a lot about, you know, just start messy and I don't know. And you know, we did a podcast recently. I, very proud to be a guest on your show. And I loved it so much. And we, you know, I talk about this a lot. Like, I just don't like lazy thinking. I don't like these standard, like, you know, just these typical statements and things that we hear so often. And because I, I, I really like thinking deeper about things. Um, and so when I hear start messy, it's like, there's either you start messy or you're perfectionist. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't think that's true. Actually. I think that you can, you know, like you said, you, 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 you set up the home in a way that felt good enough to start an open house, even though there were still decor to put in, there were things to add. And I know I can relate to that so well in my own brand building, you know, business. Um, but it was important for you to have that foundational piece to your home, feel good and feel in alignment. And, you know, I'm sure when you look back a year from now, two years from now, you're going to look back at the starting point and be like, holy shit, there's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. But I I feel like you started from a place of alignment and it wasn't, you know, this perfectionism situation, but it also wasn't, I'm just going to like get it going because, and I, I really, I want, I, I, you know, the reason why I wanted to ask you that is because I feel like it's important to hear that there is a, there is something in between and it's yep. harder to hit that line but that line is there to to dance on you know you don't have totally. to just be a perfectionist and you don't have to be you know either messy or you can like actually but this is probably a good place to go back to dance and the perfectionism part of your life because you know the difference you know the mm-hmm. difference because you've lived the difference so contrast has its value right like mm-hmm. you can you talk about that a little bit i know you have a big you know, um, history with dance. I mean, you, you were even injured from it. And let's talk about that part where of your life where you were maybe more micromanaging and more focused on perfectionism and then how that really started to how and what really helped you to surrender more and open up more and release that gripping. Totally. Oh, that's a good question. I love, I love this one because um, my dance background is, is you know, I was dancing before I could walk, mm. is what I say. I was, as soon as I could be on my feet, I was dancing and moving and grooving. And music has always been a part of my life um, in so many forms, and movement has been. And I was dancing since that time I was two. And I went, when I was eight years old, I told my mother I needed a more serious dance studio. <laughs> so I'm like, picture an eight-year-old that you know, right? And like being like, mom, I need <laughs> dance studio it's time <laughs> that was a picture of you with a bun on your head you're like mom it's time to get real <laughs> at eight exactly at eight years old and she was like okay no. and I just like love that because I think that that sets the tone for it set the tone for the next you know 10 years of my life and um I was super like my mom did a ton of research on where to send me for like a more serious dance school and super lucky I ended up at Mass Motion Dance Academy in Brighton Massachusetts mm-hmm. um and amazing teachers and they were they were awesome and I got an incredible training I naturally had a perfectionist attitude, which served me well in dance. You know, in order to, I was, in order to be right. What were you going to say? I was going to say, I just wanted to tease that apart. When you say you naturally had it, what do you mean by that? Ever since I was tiny, I wanted to do well. I wanted to excel. Um, I wanted to be the best, you know, I, I most certainly did. I'm very competitive by nature, mm-hmm. extremely competitive in everything that I do, you know, and I was not good at sports. Like hand-eye coordination was not my thing. And like team sports, I wasn't good at it. And, you know, I, I recognized that. I was like, I was like, oh, gym class, here we go. Right? Like I knew <laughs> what I was good at, what I wasn't good at. And my dad is a math science person with my sister and I, he really got us into, he was like always throwing numbers at us and wanted us to do well there. So I excelled in math. And interestingly enough, that Mm. crosses over a lot in dance because there's a lot of counting involved, like rhythmically understanding numbers and understanding timing. And so 
I kind of feel like I was programmed a little bit, right? Like I yeah. recently had my birth chart read, like programmed a little bit to be, to want to excel. Mm -hmm. um, and then I grew up in, uh, my parents, you know, are very successful in what they do and from the world of academia and wanted us to excel as well. So in everything we did, it was always like you give 110% and you, you don't stop until you get it right. You know? So it was and embedded like, in your environment growing up yes. and you have siblings? I do have a younger sister. Okay. Yeah. So that, okay. So that makes more sense. So it was like mm -hmm. almost like part downloaded, but really groomed by your environment, your, your upbringing yes. with your parents. Okay. Exactly. Both yeah. of them. And, and I'm, again, I'm grateful. Cause like, and I grew up on the East coast, you mm. know, so mm -hmm. I grew up right outside of Boston that the hustle, the mentality, the work at just like the pace yeah. that I run at, like was just natural for me. And I just like kind of took off with that. And I loved dance. And so not only did I love it, but I was good at it. I worked really, 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 really fucking hard. And I naturally have a facility, my feet and my legs. I have hip dysplasia. I'm hypermobile. So for a classical ballet, that works really well. Mm. Um, I was able to create really nice lines and it was very successful and I worked hard. So that kind of combination of things, the perfectionist mm -hmm. attitude and wanting to do well and wanting to, it's like, I can't do that. Well, I'm going to like achieve that, right? How do I like, that becomes a goal. And it was so cool to accomplish things that like I wasn't physically able to do or figure out before in my body. Sure. Um, and it just, it spiraled. I, when I was in high school and not because of my dance teachers, not because of my parents, but I, so I started to become a little bit more muscular in my mm. like, you know, just a little bit rounder in my muscles than I had yeah. been like just a completely stick, so stick thin, like in the fifth percentile for weight, you know, people thought I was unhealthy, but I ate like pasta and ice cream every single day. Yeah. And I started to get like rounder muscles and I was like, I don't really look like these classical ballerinas, like mm. quite like them. I'm like, I'm a, my muscles are a little bit rounder. And I took it upon myself. I was like, well, if I want to be a classical ballerina, I need to look a certain way. And I always said, I was like, I never want the way I look to be a deterrent. I said, I want to make sure I have in control of everything I can be in control of for the reason mm. I don't get something is like because my talent, right? Or whatever. But yeah. I don't want it to be because of the way I look, if that's something that I can control. So I developed an eating disorder. I and how old were you? I was 16. So you're like, your body is naturally just developing. You totally. know, you're moving into, so the round and you're athletic. So you're really yeah. kind of bringing out your genes and, and, and then the, um, you know, the effects of, of your athleticism as you're, totally. wow. Okay. So you're 16 and now you're like, shit, I got it. You start basically, right. You have an eating disorder. It's major. Right. I was like completely restricted with calories. It started over a summer while I was in Orlando for a ballet program. Mm -hmm. And, um, I lost a bunch of weight while I was there. My parents were like, Ooh, and then I came back. And I was already seeing um, a therapist and a psychiatrist because I had been clinically depressed the following year, diagnosed clinically depressed, um, and anxiety. And I had mono and I was super sick. So I was already being watched by people, which was good because they yeah. were able to catch it. Right. And so they caught it and I was already seeing a nutritionist. I suddenly had a whole team of doctors. I had therapist, psychiatrist, nutritional therapist. I was seeing my pediatrician once a week to get weighed because I had to meet a certain weight in order to dance. And I would water load. I would like chug like about eight bottles of water before so yeah. that I could meet the weight. And then I got caught, of course, eventually. Yeah. Um, family therapist, like the whole thing, all while trying to dance and um, trying to be in school and all these things in a super rigorous environment. So it was um, about six months of a really, really, really bad out and then my athleticism started to naturally decline yeah. right where it's like your body starts pulling from your muscles starts pulling from your bones all of your resources are being depleted so then I realized I was like well now I suck I, I can't even get across the floor because I have no I'm completely out of breath my hair was falling out I had bald mm -hmm. spots um I had directors noticing it when I was like I was actually being paid at that time to dance professionally mm. for a nutcracker season so I went to my nutritional therapist and I was like okay this isn't working yeah. So can we kind of pivot, right? Or like switch yeah. gears yeah. because this isn't working and this is not, I want to be the best dancer I can be. And I recognize this is not that. And I was fortunate that dance to me was more important than the eating disorder because mm. it's like an entity that kind of takes over your brain. Yeah. And my therapist was actually an addiction specialist. And so while she felt like she wasn't totally equipped, I really wanted to continue working with her because we had a relationship and she was able to utilize her background from addiction to, you know, cross reference with what's happening with the eating disorder. Cause there's a lot of similarities. 
So for me, I was fortunate that I had something that was more important. My athleticism in dance, my talent, my strength, which had become something that I was known for, right? I was super yeah. powerful and like being able to jump and leap and hold my leg up high and like all these things that I then was losing. Mm. So because I had that to cling on to, I was like, this is more important than this other thing. And I was able to enter recovery pretty smoothly. It was a rough another six months of my body recalibrating and stabilizing. But after that, I became so strong. I looked so good. Like I was toned and lean and muscular and like had my power and my strength back. And that you know, I, I didn't completely relapse at points. I've li I lived in five states in five years for dance. I was in Boston mm. and then Arizona, um, New York, yeah. Louisiana, and then California. So it, during that time and like the rockiness of being in New York and Arizona, I had times where I definitely had dropped weight. I had orthorexia. I did some fitness modeling in New York. That's when mm. I got my personal training certification and did some carb cycling to help drop weight. And the whole thing and like yeah. that crept back in, right? Those yeah. tendencies. But other than that, I feel like I've been pretty steady and it's yeah. been 10 years. That's it's incredible. Insane. It's been 10 wow. years. It doesn't even feel like it, you know, cause it yeah. feels like a different lifetime a little bit that I sure. feel like I'm every single day I make a choice again to step into recovery. Yeah. But, and I still, I still Skype my nutritional therapist twice a week. I'm still in, that's awesome. in the work for that. And honestly, that's what keeps it feeling smooth, right? Is that mm. constant, gentle, like reminders and bit of work, like re-establishing what I need to do to continue sure. to move forward because it feels like a different person. It feels like a different lifetime that it feels like I'm in this space where I'm in my own head. It's like Ava instead of the eating disorder. Well, okay. That's a beautiful um, place to want to ask you. What was, you know, your relationship with yourself? So when I say that, I mean like self-talk, I mean, self-confidence, I mean, self-love. What was that like in the period where you were basically when you were hardcore eating disorder versus when you transitioned into, you know, getting back into homeostasis and, you know, fortifying yourself and then moving from that, from that Ava, what was the, what was the difference? So it's interesting because there was a long period um, in which I was about three years. I was doing all the things on the outside. I was fueling my body properly. I was exercising safely. I was really fortunate to start working with a personal trainer during my recovery in high school. That was my agreement. My team, I was like, I'll do this if I can see a trainer because I wanted to like do it right. You know, yeah. I, I was like, I want to know. I didn't know that much about this stuff going on other, you know, in my body and how things worked yet. So it's like, I want to do it properly. Her name is Colleen Quinn. She's amazing. I still also Skype her twice a week. These are like the, you know, the staples in my, in my routine and my self care that like nourish my body. Mm -hmm. But I, it was in my yoga teacher training in 2014 that I realized I was like, holy shit, I have been still talking to my body in the same negative way, mm. even though on the outside, I'm doing all this work. I'm strong, I'm fit, I'm healthy, I'm eating well, I'm not restricting. And But I was like, no, I'm still having this super negative self-talk to my body. And I went through, it was like, I did an intensive, so it was the three week, 200 hour teacher training program every day, eight to six. And I ended up writing a letter to my body apologizing. No. And one of my therapists, one of my, one of my team members, she was like, you know, at some point you can try writing a letter back from your body to yourself. Mm. And I was able to do that. About a year or two later, I was able to write the kind of forgiveness back. And that was the hardest part, I think, because I realized I was like, on the outside, I'm doing all these things. And like, I'm a role model of people and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, I've overcome this thing. But the internal dialogue was still there. And I didn't even know because it was so programmed, right? Like, right. it's not good enough. Like, oh, here's this little like pinch of this, or I can't see my six pack or whatever. And constant judgment and constant body checking, right? To all of that, noticing the fluctuations. And it, it was in my yoga, it was when I got into my yoga that I was self-aware enough, of course, and then realized like, okay, there's another way. And it's not perfect. Mm -mm. You know, I don't have like the greatest relationship with my body all the time, but right. I have noticed more and more like the fact that my metabolism recovered the way that it did, which is so hard to do from something so so challenging to your body it can be it can be hard so extreme. to extreme right so extreme yeah that i developed so much gratitude for my, for my body is like mm -hmm. back from that i'm like yeah. 
don't want it to lose that, you know, I'm like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And that feeling of gratitude is what I think propelled me into being able to develop a better relationship, right? It's For like sure. the appreciation that my body can get up in the morning and move and process food and it's just do like, all the things that you ask of it. It's so important. I, I love that, Ava, because you know, I had mentioned um, you know, I've been through my own just from injuries, three knee surgeries to then gaining weight and then having to get back to homeostasis. But th- I mean, this would be a, a decade at least long, you know, when I finally, like, as I say, I cracked the code and I was able to really understand, okay, these are the foods that really do it for me. This is the training that mm-hmm. does it for me. And, you know, but in that 10 year period, in that 10 year period, um, a lot of just challenge and pain and discomfort in the body and a just like a just non appreciation right and i t- it's this is a constant in my life and my practice and you know the meditation and just it's not like a set routine it's just it's a constant meaning it's like throughout the day this happens frequently where i'm just like man i love you like thank you you're so, because listen, let me just keep it so fucking real as I do. There are still moments, women, we fluctuate, ovulation, mm-hmm. period, this, that. And it's like, you, you, fi- you look for shit to be wrong. Yeah. Every fucking woman does this. I'm sorry. Yes. I know I'm not every woman, but like, let's just the mass majority, I'm sure, you know, I think until you get to a certain age in life where you're like, you just really, I mean, I think that's the beauty of, of getting older. If you are fortunate to live. You just, you're like, fuck you. You know, um, I'm just glad that I can get out of my chair, (laughs) you know, but I mean, I, you know, I, I, I constantly just, I have so much love and respect for my body because I'm like, fuck, you know, I asked my body to do a lot of shit aside from just living a normal, like breathe and, and function. But it's like, no, I push her and she does it for me. How dare I not respect her and love mm-hmm. her? Do you know what I mean? So when you yes. when you said uh, the the beautiful piece about writing a letter to your body and then writing back, I literally got chills and I felt so much just uh, compassion and love in that moment for you to have that that relationship with your body. And it's a beautiful piece to highlight in this conversation because, girl, we know like there are so many women listening to this who who are can relate to both of us right now and 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 it's just this invitation to say like listen there's always going to be this fluctuation it's almost like par for the course of being a woman especially in today's society that yes. you're going to look Patriarchy. at yourself you're going to be like what's wrong with this that mm-hmm. but if you can just okay that's going to be there you know if you could just you know eventually i think the more you you become you, you really love your body and you really become connected to your body. This cultivates respect for your body. Then, you know, that talk and those things can start to become less and less, but I don't know if it ever fully goes away, but I do know this, it, you, the other part, the other piece where you're loving and you're appreciating and all of that becomes much stronger, becomes yeah. much more of the dialogue and the connection, but it, yeah. it takes time, right? It does. And it's so interesting you say that because I will, as I too have had one knee surgery, probably will have more, but you know, the knees these days, but um, <laughs> to be in that space of, of feeling, of knowing what it's like to be injured and to not have the full capability of your body gives you such perspective on what yes. it can do. And in yoga, you know, we talk a lot about the breath and I have people feel your breath and your heartbeat. And it's like, feel, because these are actual systems you can feel. There's a lot of things yeah. we can't you know, it, it's yeah. a lot subtler, right? To feel, sure. but these we can really tangibly feel. And it's like, there's so much, we're so complex. We don't even know how complex we are. It's just like, we, we pop out of the room. Oh, no big deal. All these things right. are functioning for me. But it's like, if you take a step back to acknowledge like the magic that is occurring constantly, just like no big deal to keep you surviving and walking and thriving and moving gives you more perspective on it. And I actually mentioned this one in my classes the other day, which is why it's so great you're bringing it up. 
we look for what's wrong instead of, I'm like, just for today, instead of like searching for what feels funky and off in your body, what if you search for what feels good, Mm. right? What feels right? Like there are so many things working perfectly for you to be able to move your body at all right now on your mat, even if you have injuries, even if there's this, whatever, instead of focusing your attention to what doesn't feel good, what if just for today you focus on what does feel good? And it's going to be a totally different experience in your practice, right? So if you can shine more light and we know energy goes where attention, energy flows where attention goes, right? Like Mm -hmm. all that, if you bring awareness to that, it's going to amplify it and make it easier. And it's again, not to say you should ignore those other things, but yeah, we're trained. There's a lot of people making a lot of money based on telling us to look for the things that are wrong. Mm. That's a a lot of people, point, right? right? When you think when you're like, may have a bad thought about your body, you're like how many people are benefiting from this thought right now, right? How many people are profiting from this thought right now? When you think about it that way, it's like, okay, well, what, what about me, right? How is this helping me? Doesn't mean you have to be like completely body positive all the time. I'm not there, but mm-hmm. to change your relationship and have a greater appreciation. And I think with what we do, we're so in tune with our bodies that we can acknowledge that people are so disconnected from their bodies. It's hard to even go there, which is right. why it's like hand on heart, hand on belly, close your eyes, feel for a moment, right? Yeah, really 100%. feel. Start there. Mm. Yeah. see what happens. It's like, so just, good. It's right? so good. Like, it's so true. That's why I love this so much yes. too, because there's proof. There's actual proof, you know, when I, there are times, Ava, when I'm running my, you know, deep sand runs on the beach and it's just, and it's hard. I I swear, I literally with one hand, I will put my hand to my heart and I will just tell myself, and there's something really, I mean, there's actual science about, you know, hand on heart and what it does to your mind and and to your, you know, your nervous system. And I will be running and I'll put my hand on my heart. Like Roxy, I love you keep going. We got this. I'm with you. I'm with you. And having this kind of connection is the armor that you need to, I mean, for life period. But if we go back to those moments where you are looking at something wrong or something is wrong or whatever, like this is a defense, you know, because this is you being on your team, staying connected to you in this present moment to say, you know, we're good. I love you. We're here. You know, it's so it's, I mean, you said it's such a great, another great point there was you can't feel everything. You can't feel DNA damage, but you can certainly feel if you, you know, can't get up and walk because you've hurt something or, or if your lungs aren't breathing, you can feel that shit. So can you take a moment to just appreciate that your lungs are breathing for you and putting this oxygen Mm -hmm. into your body. So can you appreciate your legs, not only doing deadlifts and like (laughs) yoga and, but just literally allowing you to walk, you know, cause some people don't even have that. And it's just, you know, I want to talk about yoga with you. Obviously that's a big piece um, of your life and, and really who you are. And I think that it's a great, you know, when you talk about how yoga really helped you to get into your body and really generate this connection that would then have you now, you know, in this place where you can really, not just for yourself, but, you know, for, for all of, all, all of your students and people that, you know, you teach, you really, you create the space and you can guide them into their own connection to their body. Yeah go there um with you know yoga and 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 really like let me say this i will never forget my first yoga class i was living in new york and i went i had a gym membership uh at how Crunch. old were you do you know oh my goodness um i always love to hear yeah 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 it's so hard with like years and numbers because so that's where n- i started as a personal <laughs> trainer in new york yes girl Sorry this my boyfriend lafayette crunch it was the shit that is that where you gym. were yes girl that my boyfriend. That was the, that's crazy that's crazy i wonder if we were there at the same time so this was i mean it was a long time ago because i've been back now for 13 years from new york i want to say i feel it, my first yoga class may have been around 23 20 okay. something like that you know so it was it was a long time ago but Ava, I will never forget. And by the way, I mean, you remember the yoga studio. It's not like it was this dim lit, super, right. you know, spiritual room. 
No, it was like next class was like whatever, like an aerobics class or some shit, you know? But the instructor, it was a woman and I don't remember her name, but it was so the taking in yoga and it was obviously a very good class and a very good instructor because we know that that makes a huge difference. It, it, well, it, I mean, it changed my life because yoga Mm -hmm. would become a staple for the rest of my life. And it's not like I've done it every day since, right? But it's like surfing. It's like jujitsu. It, it, I can take big ass breaks, it, but it's like my arm. It's like, I just, it's, yep. it's always going to be there now because there was way too much impact in the most outstanding way to where it just, it be, I, I became yoga, yoga, yoga became me, you know? So I would love to know what that, you know, if you had a moment like that in your, you know, kind of entrance to yoga that you can share with us. Um, for me, it was interesting because I was exposed to yoga at like 11 years old through my dance training Mm -hmm. and I hated it. I hated it so much. It was so awful. It was so boring. Like we had a teacher from my dance teacher's company who was lovely, but she was just so like gentle and mellow and like 11 year old Ava was not fucking around you know yeah. with anything like not fucking around it's like we need an eight-year-old Ava wasn't fucking around mom <laughs> we got to get serious now <laughs> exactly I was not ready to slow down I was not into that and she I mean I'm sure now I would I would love her but my first experience with it just felt so boring and did not feel like there was any benefit to it and of course I mean for it was everything was really based in the physical. We did like Matt Pilates stuff with cross training and it was all based in like the physical body and like that aspect of it, which has changed in the dance world over time, but it was really all physical then. So didn't like it, decided I didn't like yoga. And then when I came back from college, so I went to college for a semester and then I came back um, and then I moved to New York to dance professionally. In that time that I was in Boston, it was my winter breakup after that first semester. So I was 18 and my younger sister was in high school and she and some of her friends would go to a hot yoga studio um, nearby, Baptiste, Baptiste uh, Boston in Brookline. And um, I was like, I'm going to come with you guys sometime. So I tagged along and I just died. I had no upper body strength. It was so hot. And I was like, this is the most challenging. I just, it took everything in me to not leave, right. To not leave the room. And like, I couldn't even do a push up. I couldn't even do a chaturanga. I was like this. And just amazed the people around me who were just like floating through. And I thought I was in super good shape, right. I was super, I'd been dancing. And I remember that. And I was like, I need to come back. Like I need to figure this, this out. Like whatever is going on in here. I remember being so amazed at something that I had no idea existed out there that felt so challenging to me, but I also knew it was so good for me. Mm. And I really grew to love that studio and grew to love some of the teachers. I had a teacher there that I worked with closely. Um, his name is Sam- Samuel Robinson. And he, I remember there was just something about him that he held space and he was young and he was cool. And it was just like, no nonsense really, right? It was mm. just like, we were there. And we were in it and it didn't seem frou-frou. It didn't seem inauthentic, but it felt like you also just like, he was your friend, right? You were Mm. in the space and there wasn't this fluffiness, but there was also this like connection. And my sister and I were like big fans of him and I ended up like working with him later, trading like the work that we did together. And I remember that being kind of the turning point for me where I was like in this space in the hot yoga and I was like, there's something to this. And I remember getting strong in ways I wasn't very quickly and feeling um, my cardiovascular strength got better because I don't mm. have great endurance. And in dance, believe it or not, that's something that dancers lack actually is, is, wow. is not a lot of great endurance. And I remember that experience there shifting it. Um, and my trainer did her yoga teacher training at South Boston Yoga, which is then naturally where I did my teacher training because she was like, it changed my life. Yeah. I walked in there. I had never been there, but I signed mm-hmm. up for their 200 hour And I also remember that experience that day being like, these people are magic. The owners Mm. of that studio, like there is something so raw and authentic and nurturing about these people um, that completely shaped the rest of my life. You know, I had no idea. I went into that training, wanted to learn more about the practice, having no idea that I would end up actually teaching. And now it's what I do. But it's those people. It is. It's those teachers, right? That like 
that shaped that experience for you. And I'm so grateful to have several of those teachers that I feel like have given me like a home and a space that I was able to come back to. And still, when I go back to Boston, I still go take their classes, you know, and like, that's amazing. It, it's amazing. And they're, yeah. they, they're, they're there and they're cheering me on from, you know, the other side of the country. And yeah, it's, it's unlike anything else because, um, the dance world is wonderful, but it, it's different, right? There's, there's this goal or achievement in yoga. It's not a sport or competition or even art based thing. Mm. And it, it's something that's like, it's about you and from within, it's not about the shape. It's not about your leg. It's not about this. And that was so different from everything else I had known, right? Everything else right. was goal achievement oriented, like yeah. end game, you know, all of that accomplishments. And this was not that. And once I kind of really understood that and stripped that and peeled back the layers, I was able to recognize so much value in that and wanted to share that with people, right? Not just the competition, not just, you know, the drive, but it's like, how about the, what's going on here for you and not for anyone else? Yeah. Right? Like not for anybody else, just for you. And that was it, huge. It's, it's, it, I, it's amazing. And it, you know, when you, you think about, I mean, let me just ask you, do you feel that that new layer, that new skill, that new connection actually enhanced your ability to, to win, to achieve, to, I mean, I just, not only do I feel that, that does, first of all, like you need that fluidity, you need that connection. You need, you need to understand and feel yourself. And because there you we're talking about self-compassion, right? Mm -hmm. Here, we'll, we'll tease that apart a little bit. So you want to go from A to B in yoga. You want to try and hit, I don't know, suggest some kind of um, maybe the handstand or something, right? It's not an easy, unless you're a gymnast or something, like that right. shit takes time. Yes. It takes time, but you know what? It takes me more than time. It takes compassion. Mm -hmm. Compassion holds patience, right? Exactly. Which allows you to keep moving forward. And maybe, perhaps maybe, and I would say yes in my life, and I, I'm curious to what you say about this, but maybe the process of making progress inch by inch, now you're up for one second, now you're up for two seconds, actually becomes more enjoyable, right? So it's less about, damn it, I can't do it. And it's more about like, oh my gosh, look at this. I stuck it longer. Or, ooh, when I did this with my wrist, I was able to, you know, stay up there. And so it's like these intricate details. It's yep. the micro that then shapes the macro. But what are you ultimately doing? You are generating more love for the process. And yes. when you think about what that means outside of yoga or mm -hmm. off your mat, we should say, and how that translates and how, I mean, that just supports everything in life. So I, it's, it's yoga is, is one of these, um, a, a very similar to jujitsu and surfing. Truly. It's like this trifecta where I feel that what you take from yoga, the things that yoga offers you and can teach you, um, it's so beneficial and it's so transferable to the entirety of your life. Like another great example, and I would love for your thoughts specifically on this is, I feel that yoga really helped me to differentiate um, pain versus discomfort. Mm -hmm. And knowing yes. how to be okay in discomfort and then furthering that, learning how to breathe your way through discomfort until it's actually not com dis uh, uncomfortable anymore. Now you have been able to kind of like untie the knot, but you didn't panic. You, you, you allowed yourself to be there. You moved through it being very connected to yourself and you got to the other side. I love your perspective and your thoughts and maybe some experience that you have specifically um, on that. A hundred percent. It's all oh, so good. I, I agree. And yoga, it's, it's, it transfers right off the mat. And you're so right that like, it's, I think it's so different from dance as I can see yes, dance, you make progress, but it's like kind of like you get a skill or you get um, something in your technique or not. It's almost a little hit or miss. Yes. You can always do one more pirouette and like, cool. But it's like the tiniest little details in yoga. It's like, Ooh, I was working with someone this morning and it was like in an arm balance, like the tiniest little micro adjustment. Oh, I felt that. And it's like those tiny breakthroughs that can feel huge. And it gets us into our bodies, into that space of noticing 
the more, the, the, the tiny things, right? And that's, it is, it's the process. It's like how you get there, the transitions. It changed my movement quality, mm. right? Doing yoga because I was more aware of how I'm moving from one thing to the next, not just here's a leg, here's this, here's a turn, here's, it's like, no, what's the in-between happening? And I teach yin yoga and I, I lead yin yoga trainings. I attend yin yoga trainings. I'm obsessed with yin yoga, which is a practice targeting connective tissue, mm. to, like specifically in the body. And it's all about getting people. I have a teacher, his name is Bernie Clark, who wrote like the yin yoga, the guide to yin yoga, who says, we're trying to get our students to, we're not going to fly their planes for them, but we want to teach them how to fly their own planes. So teaching our students how to feel into their bodies and differentiate for themselves. What's pain? What's discomfort? What are you feeling? Where's your edge? Where's the like, is this tension? Is this compression? So I try to give my students tools to feel for themselves to make that decision for themselves, to trust your own voice, not me, right? Because I'm not in your body. Mm-hmm. I don't know. You know more, that no matter how good a teacher is, they're never going to know better than you what's going on in your body, but you have to listen. You have to listen. You have to start to know. And so the pra- the, pra- the practice, yin, yoga in general, but especially yin, teaches us, okay, what is this thing that I'm feeling? Where is this coming from? Is this pain? Is this discomfort? And then once you can differentiate, yes, it's like, how do I stay mm-hmm. in that? How do I not bail on myself, right? Anna Forrest, she talks about like, notice if you're bailing on yourself. Why are you bailing on yourself? Then check in with your body, go back to your body. Like it's working really hard for you, don't bail on yourself. And so it's that conversation. And especially with the heat, right? You've got all these other factors Ugh. and like things like, it's like that that put you into that space of being able to face it. Like I could step out of my body for a second mm-hmm. or I can stay with my body and stay with the discomfort. And then what happens? you end up okay. You're okay. Then it's over. And then, you, you know, you're like, oh, okay. Every time you're like, I'm going to die. You're not going to die. <laughs> You've never been more alive than you are in that moment. And then you retrain yourself to like, understand, okay, this is passing. This is temporary. What happens when something difficult in my life happens, a difficult encounter? It's a setback. This is temporary, right? How do I navigate and move forward instead of just like ignoring it and like, putting it be like, nope, 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 can't deal with it. Mm-hmm. How do you step into it and stay with it? And it completely translates like a hundred percent. I think I'm, I've always been fairly confrontational and like direct with people, but I think ever since I've really made yoga, like my world, I think I have way, I'm even more so able to be super upfront with people mm. and friends. And I'm unafraid of like confrontation or having a difficult conversation and standing up for myself and saying yes and saying no. And in just a way, I think I wasn't totally in my body the same way. It wasn't in my own power the same way. It's like I could go through the motions, but wasn't feeling that confidence behind it where it's like, I can trust that I can say no, or I can tell you what's up or have this argument with you and know it's going to be okay. Mm. Right? It's not the end of the world. The world isn't going to crumble. Right. And my yoga practice has taught me that 100% because it's so easy to bail. And like, it's very different than dance. And even the movement is very different than dance. And like, just the way we work our bodies and our minds has completely translated across everything else that I do. And it just like happened and it's been such a gradual process that I don't even think about it. But now that you put it in front of me, I'm like, yeah, you know? Oh, you know, it's, it's, so, that's such a great analogy and perspective and, you know, just example. And I love also the fact that it's yin yoga, which is typically more, so we have like vinyasa. I mean, there's all kinds of yoga, right? Right. But, um, you know, you think like power vinyasa, like people go in there because they want like the yoga workout and yeah. And, and, and I love power vinyasa. I do, but truly my favorite is, um, and I, I definitely love hot yoga, but, um, right now I'm not doing that because of everything that, you know, we've got going on. So, uh, I like, there's, um, an, uh, an, uh, not an academy, a yoga studio out of Vegas. That's actually virtual too. And, and there's just, practice called signature series. So it's like you stand, you sit, it's slow, but it's mm-hmm. so specific. I haven't done yin and I need to do yin with you where I'm going with this, why I value the yin factor, because yin is not necessarily correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's not like power flow yoga. No. It's way more, but this is what's so amazing. And you just explained it so beautifully and perfect. It's like, are you kidding the, the strength, the resilience that you get from that slowing down and sitting and feeling the details, like the little bitty details, right? Of, of things oh. going on and having to face it. 
versus, and I'm not trying to put power of vinyasa down because again, it all has its place. Love that shit. But it's easy to just move through things. Like I'm mm -hmm. going from one thing to the next and that's right. right. And there's avoidance sometimes in that, yes. right? And it's like, no, no, slow the fuck down. Mm -hmm. See that place where it sucks? Cool. Sit on it. Like you just like right. hang there. You're like, what exactly. is exactly and examine yourself. And I love it so much. And when Queendom opens up, we we have to do um a master class with you. And yes, you know, because you literally, when you were explaining that, all I'm thinking about is listen to this self-awareness. Listen to, I have chills on my body right now, literally. Like, look at the self-connection that's happening as you take, as you unfold, you know, and be in these moments with you in, the, in, the, in this, you know, form of yoga and how that transfers out mm -hmm. into your life, the way that you just shared. It's so wonderful. So it's like a great moment to really invite people like, hey, don't look at, don't, don't underestimate these more kind of calmer, slower, smaller movements, things of this nature. Just, I mean, whether it's yoga or whatever, just, just, you know, listen, sitting down and just breathing and doing like some stillness work mm -hmm. is fucking harder for most people to do than like 100%. go run. And that's yep. a great, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. It's hard, especially in these days, you know, right. for people to, to be with themselves and to slow down. And they're like, I, people have told me like, oh, I, the only way I can turn off my mind is to do these crazy aggressive styles and blah, 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 we're throwing things right. around. And I'm like, you are avoiding, you know, and, and I can see it and you got to meet people where, where they're at. But sure. when people start to take that time, even in a power class, if I have people hold warrior two, right. I'm like, just mm -hmm. pause for a moment. They don't want to yeah. even be there for three breaths. No. Right. And it's so funny because in my own practice, I, slowly over time in my power class, power practice, when I'm taking class, I gravitate towards going slower, which never was the case for me. And now my own body, I'm like, oh, it was way too fast. <laughs> the cue, cueing the breath way too fast because I want to be in it and feel it. And I don't want to yeah. avoid, you know, no. I don't want to fly through it. And it's so interesting to see that evolution because I'm like, I was not there. You know, I was yeah. that person just flying through it. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Yeah. People I used to practice with before that like, now I take, I'm like, whoa, it feels like, <laughs> abrasive you know I'm like I'm missing all of it I'm missing all of it and yeah. I it's and it's so interesting you make that connection because that actual that that series that you're talking about is based off of the, the classical 26 and 2 it's yes like a condensed version yes and I've led a couple yin trainings and the first one I led two years ago my director who was like co-leading it with me, oops, just flinging things around here. She um, actually had a bunch of the new 26 and two teachers take that training mm. because it's the perfect complement in the holding of the shapes. Right. And right. And like that matching. And she was like, this will be so good for you guys. This is like right up your alley. It's different, but it's also, it mirrors, right? There's so much sure. of that, 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 that tog toggles back and forth. And being a movement-based person, I always gravitated towards all this movement stuff. But as, again, I've developed my practice, I've found such a deep love for that, that opportunity to slow down and to be still. And it's completely invaluable. You know, it, oh, yeah. it is so important and it's, you can't make people understand it until they experience it. Right. I, it's like, you like know, like anything and, really like anything. And yeah. it's, I'm just always so appreciative when people give it a chance Sure, because there's often sometimes a breakthrough where it's just like, Whoa, right. right. Like, what is this? It's so right. different. And it's just like, oh. I mean, I uh, honestly, Ava, when I started doing the signature series, so there's 26, it's crazy. And I've been doing yoga forever, but like even my warrior one, just to see that little shift in where my hip would go. And this, I've been doing yoga for a long time and I'm not that rushed to the next thing. Like I'm very in my body and fluid and to the mm -hmm. best that I can, you know, but what's so cool is it affected how I lift weights. It affected my runs. It, it, jujitsu, like it positively mm -hmm. affected everything. So yep. it's so, you know, another and this will transition us to something that I want to ask you. Um, but you know, I I have a morning practice. I just actually started to be very consistent 
with, um, in my morning practice, my morning ritual, I've been consistent with foam rolling and I've been, so I start with like a 15 minute, just almost just some flowing slow, but flowing yoga uh, poses. And then it goes into foam rolling and this just touching of my body and opening and like just releasing things just feels so, so good. And really, sets my day up for it. Cause then I'll go do some more intense training or whatever it's going to be, but it just does so much for me. I would love to know what do your mornings look like? I mean, girl, you, you, you are stacked. Like Ava's always in, you know, you're working, you're creating, you're just, um, you're full on. So what, how do you set yourself up to win in at the start of your day? So it honestly changes these days because the start time of my day, <laughs> for our listeners, my boyfriend is currently washing a dish as you're here. <laughs> I'm like, it's a good man. Eyes. It's a good man. Lisa washes I'm his dishes. Yeah. Not right now. <laughs> um, it, my days start at different times, right? Especially these days. Like I have been trying to create more consistency and I won't book things uh, before a certain time with people yes. because I want to like definitely have that time in the morning for myself. And as we were talking about the other day, I've been better about getting to bed earlier because mm. since this shift, I, I'm a nighttime yoga teacher, right? Like I do not like, I have taught at 5 a.m. I have taught at 6 a.m. I don't like it because I do like to have a slower start to my morning and be, yes. not have to like get up super early and then run out of the house super early, right? Same. But to be able to have a moment yeah. a moment to breathe and to like, be like, okay, what's going on? What am I doing? I'm here and be present in that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm good about my lemon water, my, mm -hmm. my morning lemon water. I, it changes again, depending on what I've got going on in the morning, but yeah. I have a type of sadhana practice that I integrate. So meditation, breath work, mantra, mudra. Um, for me, mantra, which is repetition. And mm -hmm. I use Sanskrit mantras, which are like, um, it's an, it's like the yoga, you know, language that we use that in yeah. yoga classes of you here, and there's a certain vibration to those syllables and to those sounds that have an effect in the body. So I'm a mm. big fan of Sanskrit and there's different invocations to different gods and goddesses that, um, for different things, they have all these different powers and are kind of have their own specialties. So depending on if you need something in creativity or success and endeavors in that way, or, um, abundance or removing of obstacles what, or protection, whatever it might be, yeah. there are mantras for that. And for me, that type of meditation sits so well because I'll do, I'll hold some type of mudra, which is a hand gesture. It's like asana for your hands and then do my mantra like 108 and then to sit in silence for five minutes or however much time I have, at least five, it, to me makes such a difference because mm -hmm. then I'm, I'm in the space. I'm kind of dropped in. I'm, I'm like, okay, here I'm in my body. I can feel I've created, I've created this vibration, this resonance. And so I try to get that in at certain points. It varies when, it varies for how long, yeah. but I always have the lemon water and I've been integrating that thanks to one of my teachers who was like big on with the sadhana. She's like, you've got to be doing this in order mm -hmm. to be teaching this, you know? Sure. So that's like what my meditation practice looks like. Um, I've been finding since we've been in this quarantine time, my body has been achier for sure. I'm mm. sitting more, yeah. I'm doing more virtual work. So I find with my first private or class of the day, I'll selfishly start with like some head rolls and some yeah. seated like shoulder rolls and get into that yeah. so that if I haven't already done that for myself, because that's where I notice a lot of that fascial like adhesion stuff is in this neck and shoulder area. And so even by just kind of getting into that and finding mm -hmm. my way into my body there, it sets yeah. me up. And then movement, obviously, at some point in the day. But the mornings for me always look a little different. Yeah. Um but I found that I'm getting better rest and better sleep. So I'm not feeling as frazzled and frantic when I wake up. It's like before I was like sleeping until the last minute because I wasn't getting to bed super early and then had to get up and just start the whole day. But now there's a lot more fluidity in the entry into my day, which feels really good. I take like supplements and, you know, all the things that I, yeah, I have like the order, right? You got to do yeah. the water. You got to do this before you eat. And like yeah. <laughs> this much time right, the adaptogens <laughs> i know it's a it's a whole thing and i think and i love that you say every day looks different because i i always yeah. like to invite this idea like hey you know even in my own morning ritual it's like nothing's fucking rigid you know if you're rigid you're actually missing the point this is to set yes. you up to create space to feel good it doesn't 
it's not about you being owned by this thing. It's about you owning this practice so that it can serve you. And some days are going to look different. Some days are going to feel different, mm -hmm. you know, and to not get so wrapped up on just did it, step one, step two, step three. And if I don't do step three, oh shit, I'm not going to do well today or whatever, right. you know, cause I, cause I find that, that people get like, you know, yes. and again, it almost goes back to the very beginning of that perfectionism versus, you know what I mean? It's like, there is this line where it's like, the, you know, I actually um, just posted a recent uh, solo set about this, where I talked about I, the analogy that I gave was you know, sometimes you put the garlic in while you're cooking. Sometimes you put the garlic maybe out after, but the garlic is always consistent. And that's the piece, right? It's like, yep. have your elements, have these staples, have these pieces, let them be consistent as an overall, but they might come in differently at different times. Maybe one day you're doing this and one day you're doing that, but like mm -hmm. overall you have these, you know, the fundamentals of so the, you know, the, the staple pieces. So I, I love that. And I'm so happy and proud that you have that, you know, now implemented well. And I'm sure, you know, it, it, you're, you're feeling the benefits of it, which is, yes, what, it's what you want to be, you know, and what you want to be feeling. Um, okay. So being mindful of your time, I do, I want to ask you a couple things before we wrap up this amazing conversation. I just love hanging out with my girl. You're Me just, too. you're the shit. Um, if you had a magic wand that could for the masses that would give them one habit that would have the largest positive ripple effect what would that be and why oh that's a good one that's a good one rocks um i would say the ability the ability and the willingness to at some point in your day slow down pause listen you know, I think beginning of the day can be good. Ideally, it would be beginning of the day, some point in the middle of the day, and then end of the day, right? Like a check-in. Mm -hmm. Because I think that people are moving at a pace where they're not doing that. They're not in touch with their bodies generally, right, as an over as a yeah. whole. Um, and there's a lack of self-awareness. There's a disconnect from bodies. Mm -hmm. And there's a disconnect from other people and bodies, especially in this country, I think. There's not sometimes the awareness of like the whole, but it's sure. very much here. Right. I think that in order to get people there, there needs to be the ability to actually listen to your own body and listen to your own thoughts mm -hmm. and to not run from your own thoughts. And I've been there. I'm like, oh, I don't want to be with my own thoughts. I'm going to call someone in the car. Otherwise, I'm going to be in my... No, listen, yeah. right? If yeah. something is going, listen, mm -hmm. what is that that keeps showing up? So I think it would just be to slow the fuck down, I right? And take a moment. Like that's where it starts. Then it can develop into meditation, mm -hmm. yoga, wherever it evolves from there. But it's yeah. like, take five. Right. Take really five. take five. Right. I love it. It's powerful. Um, and it's, I know firsthand it's very effective. So that's a, so magic wand <laughs> for those of you who are watching and not just listening. Um, okay. So a couple of things before I ask all my guests this, um, before we wrap out, I have these rapid fire words that I rapidly throw at you, but you are not required to rapidly give me an answer. It's whatever these words mean to you, whatever comes top of mind, top of heart, I would just love for you to express that and to elaborate. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Love. Mm, warmth, um, compassion, unity, and awareness. All the goods. Mm -hmm. Fear. Um, listen. Listening. When I think of fear, I think to run towards it. I've learned that from you. Seek the fight. Mm -hmm. um, that's my journal prompt for my people this week. I used Aww. your seek the fight. Yeah, because I was you. so inspired by your talk the other day. Love that's you too. So good. Um, I saw something by uh, an author today, actually on Instagram, about this about fear. And she was like, everyone has fears. But if you prevent your fears from letting you do what you were put on this earth to do, 
not going to be good, right? So can you still be brave and be bold even with the fear? So it's like despite the fear. Mm -hmm. So I would say move towards it. See what happens. I love it. Yes, totally. It's like use the fear. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, I'm going to use you to make myself more courageous and brave and bold to go towards the thing. Not easy, but we know that, you know, the best things in life a lot oftentimes are, are hiding behind the, or are just behind the heart, right? 100%. So good. Um, okay. Next word is curiosity. Um, this is huge for me in my teaching with people. I'm like, be curious about your body. Uh, I think of learning and exploring and curiosity is what leads to development, right? And to um, breakthroughs of any kind. If you think about science, right? People need to be curious in order to discover, learn what's out there, right? Discover. So it's necessary. Yeah. That's so good. I know. I love curiosity. I love that one. Next one is courage. Um, This is actually like one of my kind of core values or things I keep coming back to. I think that the world needs courageous people these Mm -hmm. days. Um, And I love courage because it's, again, not dismissing fear. It's can you be brave, again, despite the fear? Can you choose to still show up and to still present yourself and offer something to people, even with all the doubts and the fears and the, the normal human stuff that shows up. Um, this like feels warm to me as well. Courage feels, feels warm, kind of like love. It's like orange and if you think of colors, it's, yeah, I love it. Yeah. Right? It's so good. Um, okay, almost there. <laughs> ah! <laughs> it's okay. Challenge. Ooh, and seek the fight. There is a challenge. <laughs> challenge has, it is one that I, I definitely love because that's, again, how are we supposed to grow without challenge, right? If there isn't something to move towards or something in our way, we're not going to, if we're constantly in our comfort zone, we're not going to grow. I have a teacher that says also, we have our comfort zone, right? Picture mm-hmm. like a little circle. And if you constantly step outside, just outside of your comfort zone, not into the danger zone, but into like the outside the comfort zone, then that becomes your comfort zone. Once you become comfortable with that and then you step a little further out and then that becomes your comfort zone until suddenly the entire world is your comfort zone. So I see challenge as like that little bit outside of the comfort zone to make your whole world, right? Suddenly your comfort zone yeah. step by step by step, inch by inch by inch. Gotta so step good. into the challenge. Gotta step into the challenge. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Almost there. Um, resilience. This one speaks to me given the past with my eating disorder and the knee. And I'm not saying I've had it like the worst, right? I like feel very lucky with cards that have been dealt in this lifetime. But um, my greatest teachers are my eating disorder and my injuries. 100%. I always say that. And that is what makes us who we are is what we've overcome, right? It's like how tough you are is directly related to like what you've had to face and what you've had to move past. So that process, that like tough skin and creating this, the toughness is, is the resilience. And that's my favorite. It's one of my favorite words. It's one of my favorite words. I love it. Not yeah. surprised <laughs> that we would be like, you know, I love it. Okay, the mama. Grit. Grit. Oh. The grit. Mm-hmm. grit is such a good one. Grit. I love, yeah. Grit is a lot of things, but especially those 10 K's in the deep sand. It's mm-hmm. fucking great, girl. Um, there's so much joy in that process though. It, it's not like this grueling process. It's like, there's so much appreciation. Like I actually have fun feeling myself just working, you know, like go Roxy, go. Uh, but it's hard, but you know, I appreciate the hard. Okay. Final word. Excellence. This is what I like to think that I aim for, that I strive for constantly. Again, downloaded partially, also instilled in me, nature and nurture. Um, I strive for excellence. I think I achieve excellence. I'm not naturally all the time, but it's what I aim for. And I take pride in that. I take pride in the excellence that I achieve. And 
the people that I surround myself with too. You know, it's the, it's the standard that we hold each other to that you will show up as the best version of yourself in what you do so that you can better serve this world. And hopefully we can leave it a little bit better than we came into it. You know, if not a lot, step by step, but it takes individuals to get there. So we need to strive for excellence in order to, in order to leave the planet a better place. My girl, (laughs) that was an excellent, excellent answer. I mean, there's no wrong or right, but it just really resonates with me. I, I so agree. And I love that you own it because it's something that I don't know if, you know, you're like, I'm proud of it. I'm like, fuck yeah, you should be because girl, you do. (laughs) (laughs) Ava girl, I love you. Um, I would love to guide our listeners, our viewers to your website. Everything will be in the show notes, but if you just want to let it out. And before actually that, I just want to say, my love, you are a total inspiration. You're an absolute contributor. You are genuine and you do make the world a better place, a lot better place. And you do it inch by inch, person by person. I am proud to be your girl And I just appreciate you. So thank you so much. That means the world coming from you. You are one of my role models and inspirations. Um, And I learned from you and you show up, like I said, you show up in my head all the time. Like, okay, let's go. I was walking on the beach the other day. I was like, I'm going to start running on the beach like rocks. (laughs) You were in my yoga this morning when I was moving into, I swear when I was moving into warrior two, I was thinking about transition in our talk. And I was like, I Ava, I miss, I miss your classes. I can't wait. I'm literally, I need to do some yin with you. So I would love, you have an epic, beautiful website. You host, uh, you know, classes there. Like I said before, there's journal prompts. So mm-hmm. let them know. Yes. So the work by Ava.com mm-hmm. is my website, just as it sounds, T-H-E-W-O-R-K-B-Y-A-V-A.com. Um, I have a couple membership options for my online platform. Um, I My Instagram handle is at Ava Moreno, A-V-A-M-O-R-E-N-O. Um, and you have it. the most, no, it's not. Yes, it's just, I have my podcast. You have a baby. It's just like a brand new baby. Oh my gosh, we didn't even go there, but we'll have you back on. We'll be doing so much more together. I already know it. Um, so, yes. You have an amazing podcast. And so yes. let's encourage our listeners and viewers to go check that out, support you, it is, subscribe. Yes, thank you. It's better is better. It's all about ways we can do better in every aspect of our lives. Um, we had you on as a guest this week and you can find us on Apple Podcasts. You can find us on Spotify. You can find us on all of the, um, all the different places awesome. you get your podcasts. Perfect. Better is better. If you have trouble finding it, search my name, Ava Moreno, and then it will show up. Perfect. All right, my love, I know you have to hustle. So everybody, you guys, if you haven't subscribed yet to this podcast, do so. Check out my girl. You know what to do. Instagram, take her yoga classes straight up. I'm very particular about who I train with, like I just am. And this is my girl. So get on it. I love you. You guys, I'll catch you later. Love you. you. Bye. (laughs) 